I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Troyan Brennan, Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of CVS Caremark. Dr. Brennan has co-authored a perspective article on chain pharmacy action to curb the abuse of controlled substances. Dr. Brennan, you note that pharmacies have a role to play in the oversight of prescriptions for controlled substances, especially opioid analgesics. What persuaded CVS that it could do something to address this problem? Well, I think we were forced by the degree of the public health problem represented by inappropriate use of opioid medications. So over the last couple of years, we've noted with some alarm the increasing number of accidental deaths associated with opioids. And we have a role, uh, both a historical role and a current role, in terms of attempting to address inappropriate prescribing. The federal and state laws require the pharmacist to make a determination as to whether or not prescription is appropriate, and if not, then to not fill that prescription. But it's a difficult situation for many of our pharmacists because they are seeing a patient in front of them, and the patient has a valid prescription from a prescriber who's got a valid DEA number. And based on the information that they have available, it's often difficult to decide whether or not this is an appropriate prescription. So we were looking at that and thinking, well, you know, we have a lot of information on our prescribers. There's a million prescribers in our database, and we could characterize prescribers in a lot of different ways and perhaps provide information that would eventually be helpful. And it seemed like there was no reason not to use that kind of structural data. So we undertook the analysis that's outlined in the New England Journal of Medicine and have identified a number of people who are outliers and then basically worked with them. And some of them, we ended up suspending their ability to fill prescriptions to CVS Caremark. Because just thinking again is a, that this is a way, at least in some part, to help support our pharmacists and the determinations they have to make. You say in your article that although some states have tried to thwart so-called pill mills through regulation, It hasn't always been clear how successful they've been. What has happened in Florida and other states that have tried to regulate? Well, Florida attempted to regulate by ensuring that doctor's offices could not both prescribe and then dispense medications. They stopped the dispensing of medication in physician offices. But that probably didn't do much other than kind of push the problem downstream to the retail pharmacies. So those physicians were still writing prescriptions and patients were getting them filled. It's just that they could no longer fill them in the doctor's offices and had to come to the retail pharmacies. As you say, you have more than a million prescribers in CVS Caremark's database. You found 42 outliers. Does that seem like a low rate to you? And does that, for you, give some sense of the size of the problem nationally? Well, it is a low rate and doesn't really size the problem nationally. What we were trying to do was to ensure that we didn't get any false positives. That is, you know, we didn't want to be sanctioning physicians who were reasonably prescribing opioid medications. So we tried to aim to a very small group at the outset, sort of do this as sort of a proof of concept. And so when we interrogated our data, we set very high parameters on, very high percentages on the parameters we looked at. So we were looking at the top 1% of prescribers and then the top 1% of prescribers within that specialty and then top 10% in terms of the age of the patient and top 10% in terms of the distance the patient traveled. So we basically pushed ourselves way far to the left of the spectrum and identified people who were prescribing, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 times as much uh, opioid medication as the average practitioner did. And then we called those people up on the telephone, or at least contacted them and said we wanted to talk to them on the telephone. And some we did manage to talk to on the telephone and talk to them about the nature of their practice. And indeed, some of these people, even though they were far outliers, had perfectly valid reasons as to why they were prescribing so much opioid medication, like a medical director for a hospice a large hospice company. So that worked well from our point of view, but a lot of people wouldn't talk to us, and so we ended up suspending their ability to prescribe without having had a conversation with them. But the whole idea here was to see how well this worked and go after the people who looked like they were the most egregious and then use that as a sort of proof of concept that would then provide the authorities and perhaps the retail pharmacies kind of working together with an approach that would be sort of objectively based on empirical information as a way to find prescribers who might be prescribing inappropriately. Among the prescribers that CVS suspended, three have requested 
reinstatement. So have they been reinstated, and is there a process at CVS for making that happen? Yes, we're sort of fielding their inquiries and then having further conversations with them. As I said, a lot of people, at first, you know, even though we sent three letters, they still refused to talk with us, thinking maybe that this was not something that was within the bounds of what normally a retail pharmacy does. But once that their ability to prescribe at CVS was suspended, that sort of brought them around. So one of those people has been reinstated because we thought they had valid reasons for why their prescribing practices appeared as they did. One of those people we've continued to keep suspended because appropriate information hadn't come through that convinced us that this was something that could be characterized as appropriate. And then a third is still under consideration. Of course, as you recognize, the prescribers who've been suspended from CVS can simply tell their patients to fill their prescriptions elsewhere. So three questions. Has there been any move to collaborate with other pharmacies? Has there been any move to create a national database, as you suggest in your article? And what about notifying state medical boards about the issue? Well, a uh, good three questions. Let me take them in turn. First of all, has there been any effort to collaborate with other pharmacies? We realized that what we did was not a comprehensive solution because you said it's very easy for people to just say, okay, so CVS is not filling your prescriptions. Go to another retail pharmacy. That might raise questions with patients about exactly what's going on with their doctor or the person who prescribed the medications for them. So, But nonetheless, it is an easy place for or people to just go and seek medications elsewhere. But we wanted to basically outline what we did from an empirical point of view and suggest how structural data could be developed and get that out there to the public for some debate about the appropriateness of this kind of approach that we took. And so we think that there may be the ability to collaborate with pharmacies on this, the retail pharmacies. However, we think probably the best approach is the second approach, which, as you suggested, is a a comprehensive database. There are databases in various states, uh, prescription drug monitoring programs, that would allow authorities, either at the state level or at the federal level, the DEA, to basically collect this same kind of data that we put together and take steps similar to what we've done, only comprehensively, because everyone participates in those data banks. However, many of those data banks are voluntary, and they are on a state-by-state basis. The National Association of Boards of Pharmacy is now trying to um, knit together the various different prescription drug monitoring programs, make them mandatory, and get to a sort of single solution, which would be good from our point of view, because be much easier to have sort of a streamlined approach in one prescription drug monitoring program to participate in nationwide. So we are supportive of regulatory efforts and hope that this kind of paper will prompt the regulators to think in these terms. We have not been in touch with either state medical boards or the DEA about the people we suspended, but we are obviously the DEA or the state medical boards can ask for that information, and we would have to provide it. So we're on sort of a wait and see to see if the authorities are interested in it. There's been at least one attorney general's office that has reached out to us for that kind of information. Beyond controlled substances, are there other roles that pharmacies could be playing to improve public health and safety? Well, we think that we and other pharmacies are beginning to sort of extend the role of the pharmacist Obviously, with the relative shortage of healthcare professionals, especially doctors, as we sort of look forward, there's some aspects of primary care where the pharmacist could assist the primary care doctor or the medical home in terms of ensuring that patients on the appropriate medications and taking those medications and addressing gaps in care. Obviously, pharmacies have begun to provide things that they didn't do in the past, like vaccinations and the like. I think there'll be more laboratory testing at pharmacies. So we see a variety of ways in which we could be working with the medical home to extend the role of the pharmacist. Obviously, connectivity is the important thing, but there are efforts underway today for us to be able to communicate directly through the electronic medical record with the medical home. So we think that there's a good way to get the pharmacist involved, yet maintain the cohesion that's really important, especially in good primary care. Thank you, Dr. Brennan.